You're listening to Unsavory, where true crime meets food. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. And I'm Becca. And you're listening to the podcast formerly known as Dietetics After Dark. (laughs) Welcome to Unsavory. If you haven't already noticed, we officially changed our name from Dietetics After Dark to Unsavory. Becca, do you love it? I love it, of course. What was the main reason we changed it? Well, people thought uh, we were either talking about diuretics or diabetics. It was Mm -hmm. very confusing. I got a lot of diabetics. Yeah. And then when I was home (laughs) this summer, my brother was like, after dark sounds sensual. (laughs) I honestly didn't. That didn't cross my mind until your brother mentioned that. Never crossed my mind. Whoops. I know. And then I was like, ah, we've got to change this. (laughs) I don't want to give the wrong impression. Yep. And this is also the official start of season two. We're so excited to be back. We've missed doing this so, so, so much. And we have some incredible episodes lined up that we can't wait to share. Truly, if you thought season one was good, you're in for a real treat. Mm -hmm. Some of the episodes that we have lined up, which we're not going to share, we're going to keep them top secret, I'm beyond excited about. Including this one. This one is so, 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 so cool. And then another fun update is that by the time this episode is released... Becca got married. Uh, Yes, this is true. She'll be a married woman of 10 days. (sighs) I know. It's actually crazy that it's coming up so fast. Yeah. We are, what, eight days out? About that, yeah. Nine days. Nine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm not counting down. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling good. (laughs) I'm just like busy kind of tying up all those loose Mm -hmm. ends. But um, Mm -hmm. if I could offer a recommendation to anyone listening (laughs) is... Don't plan a wedding when you're doing a master's program and Mm, starting a podcast. mm. It's a lot. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, that's definitely um, a long to-do list. And I always feel like I'm stressed out. And then I talk to you and I'm like, oh, yeah, at least I'm not also (laughs) planning a wedding. (laughs) Sorry. I hope it makes you feel better, not worse. (laughs) It does. No, it makes me feel better. It makes me feel a lot better. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, amazing. Let's get into it. Okay, so this episode is one that we both find so fascinating. So today, Sarah is going to start us off by telling us all about the digestive system. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about different career paths and stuff within forensics and how food from the digestive tract can be used to solve crimes, including one of the most high profile and shocking crimes that was solved using digestive forensics. I'm so excited. Let's do it. Before we get into it, I have to say, I think we coined the term digestive forensics. I think we did too. Which is fascinating. It just makes sense. Like, I can't believe it hasn't been coined before, but I was Googling it and I was like, I don't actually think this is a thing, but we're making it a thing. Yes. (laughs) And I'll explain what we mean by it. It's kind of just like the overarching term for anything forensic related in the digestive Mm -hmm. system. Full stop. Let's do it. Okay. Let's get into it. The information in this podcast is for entertainment and educational purposes only. If you're interested in medical nutrition therapy or personalized nutrition advice, please talk to a physician or registered dietitian in your area. If you have a history of disordered eating, be advised that nutrition details will be discussed and take the steps you need to protect your recovery journey. All the citations and relevant links for anything mentioned in this episode will be in our show notes on our website, unsavorypodcast.com. This podcast may contain coarse language, mature subject matter, and content of a violent or disturbing nature. Listener discretion is advised. This is an independently produced podcast. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can sign up as a donor through the Patreon link in our bio. If you could rate, review, follow, and share our show with your true crime and food-loving friends, that would really help us out, and we will be forever grateful. So before we dive into the fascinating world of solving crimes with food, it's helpful to learn what the heck digestion actually entails. Mm -hmm. So digestion is the process by which food is broken down into smaller molecules that the body can actually absorb and use to sustain life. So growth, immunity, and repair are all things that require energy from digestion. The digestive tract stretches up to 30 feet or 9 meters from mouth to anus. And yes, that is not the only time I'll be saying anus in this, in this <laughs> intro. Comes up a surprising amount of times. And about 22 to 23 feet or seven meters is made up from the small intestine alone. So it's a really long, squiggly 
intestine wrapped up in your abdomen. So food is broken down as it moves through the digestive tract, which includes the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and eventually the anus. Yay. And the accessory organs as well. So the teeth, tongue, glandular organs, such as the salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Did you know the teeth are an organ? I did not know they were an organ. I knew that they were involved in digestion. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So food typically takes six to eight hours to pass from your mouth to your large intestine. And then it takes about 36 hours for food to move through the entire colon. The whole process from mealtime to toilet time takes about one to five days, but that can vary a lot between different individuals. So it'll depend on a lot of different factors like your metabolism, your stress levels, your activity levels, what you eat, all sorts of different things. So there are two different types of digestion, mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion is the physical breakdown of chunks of food into smaller pieces. So this basically makes it easier for chemical digestion to actually occur because the smaller particles can be acted upon more effectively by digestive enzymes. Mechanical digestion includes all of the chewing, shearing, and sloshing around that occurs along the digestive tract that breaks down your food. So physically breaking it down is basically what I'm talking about. So The mechanical breakdown starts in the mouth with chewing, of course, with our teeth, and then it continues in the stomach, which is a fairly muscular organ, and it churns and it mixes the food and it breaks it down into smaller pieces. And then when the food leaves the stomach, most of the mechanical digestion has been completed. And as a result, you have this thick sort of semi-fluid that's a mix of stomach juices and digestive food, and it's called chyme. And that is what enters your small intestine, where most of the nutrients from our food will be absorbed. Of the, actually, Becca, maybe this is a fun fact, but are any of the macronutrients absorbed through your stomach? I'm cheating, but it's alcohol. I know you're cheating. (laughs) So the only macronutrient that's absorbed through our stomach is alcohol. The other three main macronutrients that we actually need to sustain life and energy and growth and repair, so lipids protein, and carbohydrates are all absorbed through the small intestine. Fun fact. So carbohydrates are broken down into simple sugars like glucose. Proteins are broken down into amino acids and lipids are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. Breaking down the macronutrients into their smallest components is largely done through chemical digestion or enzymes. And enzymes are secreted even before you take your first bite of food. So when you smell delicious food and your mouth starts to water, there's actually amylase being secreted in your saliva to help break down carbohydrates. Kind of cool. So cool. And one simple trick, I just threw this in here, is that like when we're talking about enzymes, they always end in A's and all sugars always end in O's. So just a simple way to tell your enzymes and your carbohydrates apart. And while we're on the topic of spit, saliva also contains mucus, which helps to lubricate the food and helps form it into a compact little unit called a bolus, which I've never liked that word. It's kind of a gross word. It comes up in my part too. Bolus, (laughs) yeah. And a fun fact is that the average person produces two pints of saliva every day. Kind of gross, eh? That's a lot, yeah. So two pints is the equivalent just for a visual of two tall cans. Oh my goodness. Two tall <laughs> cans of like a mucusy saliva, yeah. Mucusy liquid. Well, it's kind of gross. Mm-hmm. Okay, so carbohydrate digestion starts in the mouth, but it's actually completed in the small intestine with the help of more amylase, which is secreted by the pancreas, which helps break down longer carbohydrate chains into progressively shorter chains until you're left with the shortest chain of all a monosaccharide named glucose. And we have so many episodes where we talk about glucose and sugar breakdown or sugars in general. So you can go explore the library. But then glucose is absorbed from the small intestine into the bloodstream, passed off to your cells that need energy, where glucose can then enter into glycolysis, which I will thankfully not be talking about. 
Digestion of the sugar lactose, which is found in milk, requires a very specific enzyme called lactase, which breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose, two monosaccharides. And people who are lactose intolerant actually lack the enzyme lactase, so they can't break down that lactose sugar. Proteins are essentially long chains of amino acids, and protein digestion just involves breaking the chains of amino acids into the individual component amino acids. And this process involves three main enzymes, so pepsin in the stomach and trypsin and chymotrypsin, which are secreted by the pancreas into the small intestine. And then the stomach also secretes hydrochloric acid to make the stomach environment highly acidic, which is essential for pepsin to even work. To properly break down the protein, it needs that acidic environment. And then trypsin and chymotrypsin are hanging out in the small intestine, and they actually require a basic environment or an alkaline environment to work. So then we get bile squirting in from the gallbladder, which actually neutralizes the acidic stomach contents or the chyme that I mentioned earlier as it empties into the small intestine so that the other enzymes can work. It's all very complicated. I was going to say, it's such an (laughs) intricate process. It's so detailed. It's pretty amazing. Which is why there's actually, what is it, the thermal effect of food? Yes. Which we'll be talking about next episode. Yeah, we will. And how you're actually burning calories Mm -hmm. and energy while you digest things because there's so much going on. Totally. It's work. (laughs) Your body's doing a lot of work when it's breaking down your food. And then for lipids or fats, the chemical digestion of lipids actually begins in the mouth where an enzyme called lipase is secreted into the saliva. But most of the lipid digestion occurs in the small intestine as well with the help of pancreatic lipase from the pancreas. The pancreas does a lot of work here too. I feel like it's an underrated organ. Totally. I know. I feel like no one knows what it does, but without it, we wouldn't be breaking down our food. And yeah, so the pancreas secretes pancreatic lipase and bile is also secreted by the liver. And that helps break down the large lipid molecules into much smaller ones called micelles that can then cross the small intestine and make their way into the bloodstream. Hate the word bolus. Love the word micelle. (laughs) I love the word myself too. (laughs) Okay, so now some things, thankfully, do make it through the digestive tract largely untouched, like fiber. And fiber is the portion of plant foods that can't be completely broken down by human digestion. So it will pass through the entire digestive system largely untouched by chemical digestion. Fiber will actually undergo some degree of fermentation and breakdown in the large intestine thanks to our microbiome. That's all our little good bacteria friends hanging out in the colon. But it isn't completely broken down. So fiber would be of particular importance in digestive forensics when identifying different species of plants found either in the digestive system or in the feces. So the moral of my intro to digestion here is to make sure that you're regularly getting enough fiber so that if you ever, knock on wood, have an autopsy performed (laughs) on you to determine the final moments before your death, then the medical examiner can have lots of high quality fiber to use as evidence. Like we needed another reason to eat more fiber. (laughs) I know. (laughs) And I did include the recommended amounts in Canada is 25 grams a day for women and 38 grams a day for men or males. And most Canadians do not reach that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that amazing overview, Sarah. Was it like a flashback to uh, <laughs> to undergrad? Oh, yeah, a little bit. All of the, <laughs> like, the chyme and the, all those words, I, I feel know. like, it, yeah, they definitely trigger me a little bit. Chymotrypsin. <laughs> I know. I was like, Ugh. <laughs> pepsin. Ah. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Okay. So as you said earlier, I am going to be taking this digestive process information and I'm going to put it into action. So I went down so many rabbit holes for this episode (laughs) and even the like academic papers and textbooks on this topic are so, so interesting since they actually cover real cases, which I guess I wasn't really expecting, but they do so from an evidence-based perspective. 
And I would highly recommend doing a quick Google Scholar search on the cases that you find the most interesting because it's so wild to see like scholarly articles talking about Mm. crime. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely doing that tonight. Bedtime reading. Yes. (laughs) Okay, one of the main sources that I used includes Cases Using Plant Anatomy by Bach and Norris in the Forensic Plant Science Journal. And you can find all of the other sources that we used on our website, which will be linked in the bio. Domain name TBD. (laughs) Probably unsavory something. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay, so... As was said, I'm, today I'm going to be talking about digestive forensics, which is that term that we coined. <laughs> so I will be using this term, digestive forensics, to describe the analysis of food stuff in forensic cases, as there are a bunch of different names that can be used for it. Uh, so it can be called things like forensic botany or forensic pathology, and the name is based on what exactly the specialist is looking at and what their qualifications or areas of expertise are. So I am actually going to break down some of these specialties because I found it so interesting, as well as some of the differences between like the most common forensic terms that we know. So things like uh, coroner or medical examiner. So many of these are used interchangeably, but there are some differences and some history, which I thought was cool. I love the history. Same. So to start, all of these terms or rules fall under what is called forensic science, forensics, or criminalistics, which are the tests, methods, and techniques of investigating a crime. And it isn't limited to work on crime scenes like in CSI, but most of this work actually takes place in labs or office environments. So such as things like forensic accounting that looks at financial misconduct or digital forensics that looks at instances of cyberbullying. So it's a huge area that essentially applies science to determine if laws are broken. And it's often used in either civil or criminal cases. So cool. So within this area of science, there are many roles or jobs that people can hold. For instance, a coroner can certify a death, but they do not necessarily perform an autopsy themselves. So way back when, in the medieval times, around 1190, Coroners in England were crown officials who acted as judicial officers and actually collected tax following an unnatural or violent death. This tax, which basically consisted of the individual's possessions and finances, was collected for the crown, whereas previously it might be taken by corrupt sheriffs. So when you committed a felony way back then, you actually forfeited all of your belongings Even things like suicide, which was called self-murder, was considered a felony at this time. So the role of the coroner was essentially to keep those assets safe from corruption for the queen. What if you had a family? Would the coroner still take it? I think in the case of a felony, I think that they do. They take it as a tax. Ugh, that's awful. I know. It's pretty terrible. Today, a coroner might deem a death as suspicious or violent and order an investigation into it, but they aren't always required to be a physician. So each state in the U.S. and province in Canada has different requirements and responsibilities under this job title. In Ontario, coroners must be MDs or physicians, but in other provinces in Canada, they might come from like a variety of different backgrounds. Huh, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I thought they always had to be doctors. Not in the case of a coroner. Hmm, Okay. Medical examiner is a bit different, but I'll get into that. Gotcha. And this goes, it's the same within the states. So they're usually an appointed or elected county official, such as someone in law enforcement, but they might also just be an appointed citizen. And I don't know if that's as common anymore, but previously it could just be any old Joe An appointed Schmo. citizen yeah. that, that took great interest in dead bodies. <laughs> Which could be concerning. <laughs> I hope they had at least some sort of really strong interview system or something before <laughs> I hope they. So, yeah, they're normally appointed, so it's like somebody elected or appointed, I guess. So they would normally be somebody that was, I guess, reputable. And today, they are usually individuals who have a university background or experience in forensics or criminology. Usually, okay. I hope it's very often, <laughs> most of the time. Okay, next we have medical examiners. And for the most part, they have taken over the role of a coroner, even though some coroners still do practice today. 
So in both Canada and the U.S., they must always be physicians, usually forensic pathologists, but not always. In Canada, each province either has a medical examiner system or coroner system, so one or the other. And in both countries, so the U.S. and Canada, uh, medical examiners are usually appointed in their role, not elected, like a coroner can be. And they can issue a death certificate and collect evidence. They usually work with law enforcement or public health officials. And essentially, it's their job to determine if further investigation is needed. Okay, so I definitely thought coroners and medical examiners were the exact same thing. Yes, and they're all, like those terms are normally used interchangeably. I actually didn't know there was a difference until I started doing this research. But the difference is huge, <laughs> and it's probably the exact same as like online certified nutritionist versus registered dietitian. For sure. So I bet medical examiners are like, womp, got called the coroner again. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness. Okay, so as I mentioned, most medical examiners have their MD, but they sometimes also have that training in forensic pathology. And for this reason, medical examiners are also often called forensic pathologists and vice versa, even though, again, there's a small difference. So forensic pathologists specifically look to establish the cause of death. So the who, when, where, how, and by what means. This is a bit different from general pathologists who look at the onset and diagnosis of disease. Forensic pathologists, on the other hand, usually perform autopsies, interpret lab results and toxicology reports, and give expert testimony during a trial. They require education beyond their medical degree on topics such as ballistics and toxicology, and they're typically in school for like 13 years prior to being certified. Wow. So in short, Forensic pathology is the study of death or cause of death, and they evaluate the evidence and determine what happened. Okay. And these are the people, like whenever I'm watching a true crime documentary, when the forensic pathologist comes on and is like, I could tell the direction of the bullet from the blood spatter on the wall or like from the claw marks on the head or whatever. I think that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm They're glad like you're the superstars. <laughs> yeah, no, I am. Because I genuinely, like, I had a coroner, medical examiner, forensic pathologist. I had no idea what the difference was. I just thought they were all kind of the same. No, I hadn't even thought in my head, what's the difference between these before I started what's researching this? What's a mortician? This? Fact check. It's an undertaker. What's an undertaker? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> fact check. <laughs> Double fact check. This is what I mean in terms of rabbit holes. An undertaker is a person whose business is preparing dead bodies for burial or cremation and making arrangements for funerals. Right. Also known as a funeral director or mortician. Okay. I thought it was maybe the person who puts makeup on dead bodies. And I think that's probably part of it. Probably. A pathologist examining the digestive tract can learn a wide range of things about the deceased from examining contents in the stomach and the intestines. They might look at vomit and feces and can also determine whether or not the individual was poisoned by looking at things like the liver. The identification of plant or animal foods in the digestive system can give valuable information about the final hours surrounding somebody's death and its time frame to help pinpoint that time of death. And it can also help to establish a link between the victim and location. So food items found in the digestive system would then be subjected to macro or microscopic analysis. Unfortunately, this process is not always helpful as many components of food are beyond recognition after being chewed and passed through the acidic environment within the stomach. Especially things like baked goods and processed cereals, they can be extremely difficult to identify. But even in these cases, sometimes time of death can be estimated based on where the food is found within that digestive system. Mm. Yeah, I could see processed cereals being really tough. <laughs> yeah. It would just be like a perfect mix blend of acid and milk and cereal. Yeah, they probably need <laughs> a to think about. taste tester to you know, <laughs> what? see what cereal it is. <laughs> But I think it's cool that they can use the liver to tell if someone was poisoned. Yeah. And I didn't really mention that in the intro, but like the liver is our built-in detox system. Mm -hmm. So if, it, if there's a poison in the body, your liver is going to be working really hard to get rid of it. Yeah. So that's super cool. No, it is. It's very, very interesting. All of this, so good. Such good, <laughs> such good content. Such good stuff. <laughs> okay. So I actually spoke with my hometown neighbor 
who is a forensic pathologist, and he mentioned that they will also do some small biopsies on the intestines to pick up clues as to what may have happened or how that person may have lived. They might find bacteria in the stomach, so like H. pylori, and um, that might have caused food poisoning that may have led to the death. Or they might look at the small intestines for things like celiac, Crohn's disease, or cancer. Pathologists can tell you a ton about the life that that person lived, and it can be said that they like kind of speak for the dead after they're gone. Hmm. That's kind of nice. It is kind of nice. It's nice to know that there's people vouching for you after you're gone. Yeah, for sure. My neighbor also said that he couldn't recall any criminal forensic autopsy cases solved by pathologic examination alone. So it usually takes more evidence since digestion can be unique to us as individuals. So it's not the same process through and through as Sarah was saying. Like Mm -hmm. there's things like physical activity that can impact that. And some people it'll take days and days to digest something. Some people will be less than 24 hours. Yeah, exactly. It's not as consistent as it should be for the purposes of solving cases. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So he did say that he was familiar with a few cases where, like, essentially the opposite has happened, where somebody has died of sudden asphyxiation or suffocation, only to find that during the autopsy, that person who asphyxiated actually choked on a large ball of food or a bolus. Oh. Mm -hmm. So in these cases, they identified that, like, no foul play was involved, where maybe it was suspected initially, and that, like, a ball of food was to blame. Okay. Because someone could theoretically be eating something alone in their house and choke and pass away. I know. And if someone stumbled upon that scene, they might be like, wow, he looks, this individual looks completely untampered with. Mm -hmm. How did they die? Sudden asphyxiation. And then when you get in there, yeah, you see. It's an important job. Okay. Depending on what the forensic pathologist finds, other specialists may also be called in. Some of these experts include forensic anthropologists who look at skeletal remains to identify things like sex, age, and race, forensic entomologists who look at insects on the body to determine time of death and location, as well as forensic botanists who look at plant materials and soil within and around a crime scene. Okay, forensic entomologists, that's the one that I could never, ever, ever do. (laughs) Yeah, It'd be gross. You'd be looking at maggots, probably. My dad's a biologist, and Mm -hmm. when I was home the other week, there were literal moths in, like, little test tubes in our refrigerator. Oh, my goodness. So I feel like I could do it (laughs) at this point. (laughs) Okay, you can have that job for sure. I took entomology in my first undergrad, Mm -hmm. and it was actually really cool, and I felt like I I grew a greater respect for insects, but I still don't want to be involved with them on a regular basis. That's fair. I actually don't think I do either. I saw a centipede <laughs> yesterday in the house and yeah, no, no bueno. Those are bad. <laughs> too many legs. Too many legs. <laughs> okay. So forensic botany is what we will be focusing in on the rest of the episode as it is most often tied to food stuff in crime scenes. So botanists don't really work with the deceased themselves, but they help make connections between any evidence and the crime. So they can help identify where and when a crime was committed and by whom. There are even more mini niches or specializations under forensic botany, if you can believe it. So such as things like molecular biology, ecology, limnology, which is the study of aquatic environments. It might actually help you uncover information if there's something like algae found on the body. Wow. But also pollenology, which is a study of pollens and dendrochronology, which is the study of tree rings, and systematics, which is the classification of plants. So pollenology, which is the study of pollens, is often used um, since pollen actually doesn't really decay. So it's really good evidence. Oh my goodness. It's also unique to its location and the time of year. So it can help you identify a crime scene and whether or not a body was transferred. Wow. I like, what a world of forensic pathology that I didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is so cool. So the uh, the Soham murders where there are those two young girls who were taken and killed by somebody who worked on their school grounds. I think it was in England. It was pollen, I think, that actually helped solve the case. That is so cool. Mm-hmm. Anyways, moving on. This specific next thing I'm about to tell you doesn't actually have anything to do with food or digestive forensics specifically. 
but the first known case to have ever used forensic botany or dendrochronology in a trial is that of the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. I love the Lindbergh baby story. It's so fascinating, eh? It's so fascinating. And this will, I mean, all piece together once you, like, remember the determining factor that solved the case, which was wood. (laughs) But um, on March 1st, 1932, Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr., who was the 20-month-old son of Anne Morrow and the famous aviator Charles Lindbergh, he was taken from a second-floor window in Hopewell, New Jersey. Left behind was a pretty sketchy-looking homemade ladder and a ransom note demanding $50,000 if they wanted the baby back alive. So around 10 p.m. that night, the child's nurse alerted the parents of the child's absence, and the police were called. Because the parents were home during this time, there was a lot of speculation and theories that circulated about whether or not they were involved in the crime, but there was never any strong evidence to suggest this. There were a few attempts to pay this ransom, but none were successful in getting the child back. The police did record the serial number from the bills used to pay the kidnappers, But unfortunately, two months later, on May 12th, baby Charles Lindbergh was found dead in a forested area near his home. So it took two years, but they finally tracked down some of the ransom money when a gas station attendant called the police on a suspicious-looking man who had paid with one of the bills. And this was Bruno Richard Hopman. So the state of New Jersey hired a wood expert or a Denver chronologist named Arthur Kohler. And he found that the wood from the ladder matched some wood found in Bruno's home. Kohler found consistencies in the nail holes and distinctive marks in both the ladders and attic floorboards, as well as the same combination of four different types of wood. So using that evidence and some of the ransom money found in Hotman's garage, he was convicted of kidnapping and murder. And he was executed in 1935. So even though some people still believe in his innocence, the evidence provided from the wood is more than circumstantial. And it goes Mm -hmm. to show how, like, the uniqueness of plants can almost be used like a fingerprint in a criminal case like this. Yeah, that is is so cool. And also, I mean, with the ransom money being found there as well, I feel like it's like a, yeah, we got this guy in combination with the wood. Yeah. And there are, like, if you want a wormhole to go down tonight— Google the Lindbergh baby, because there are some crazy theories. It's, I don't know why I just love that story. It was such a huge case back then, and I feel like it still Mm -hmm. is today, even though it's solved. Solved. Yeah. 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 Solved with air quotes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Another very famous case involving forensic botany is that of John JonBenet Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really going to get into it too much here, since I feel like this case has been covered thousands of times, if not millions. But the pineapple that was found in John Bonet's digestive system indicated the time of death and actually helped corroborate her parents' retelling of the events since they had mentioned the pineapple in their statements to police. Mm -hmm. So, of course, like this evidence didn't help solve the case since it still remains unsolved today, uh, but it did play a factor in um, what we do know about the facts of this case. For sure. That's like the world's most famous pineapple. Truly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so now on to our main story. I took a couple detours there and had to tell you. They're both so cool. Yeah. And such epic cases. Epic cases. Forensic botany. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of the most famous cases involving forensic botany also involve children. I don't know why Mm. that is, but brace yourself. Okay. I'm ready. So I'm going to be covering the Hendricks family murder. All right. The Hendricks family was made up of David and Susan Hendricks and their three children, Rebecca, Grace, and Benjamin. They lived in Bloomington, Illinois, and were devout members of the exclusive branch of the Plymouth Brethren, which is a nonconformist evangelical Christian movement that doesn't have any real churches or leadership. David, the father, he was born in 1954 to a family in Oak Park, Illinois, with seven children. Susan, the mom, she was born a year before him just outside of Oak Park. And they met at a church gathering when David was just 15 and Susan was 16 years old. Susan got a job at a religious publishing company and needed a place to stay, so she moved in with the Hendricks for the first few days of her new role. She was offered a full-time position at the publishing company and continued working for them while taking high school classes at night in Oak Park. 
By the end of the year, David and Susan were secretly engaged. And in 1973, so in their 18 and 19, they got married. Following just two years of university, David began working for an orthotics and prosthetics company that created artificial limbs and braces. Following David's start in that role, Susan gave birth to their first child, Rebecca. Then only one year later, she became pregnant with her second child, Grace. David then left the prosthetics company and started his own business in Galesburg. It ultimately flopped and they decided to move to Bloomington. Susan then gave birth to their son, Benjamin. So that was in 1978. David continued to work in the prosthetics field. And a year later, he filed for a patent for a back brace that he had created called the Cruciform Anterior Spinal Hyperextension Orthosis, or the CASH Orthosis. That definitely needs an acronym. (laughs) For sure. A great acronym, though. Worked out perfectly. I wonder if he had to rejig that or if it just fell into place. Yeah, he was like, oh, perfect. (laughs) C-A-S-H. But yeah, so this brace, it essentially stabilizes the spine and it limits movement in certain areas. And I did look it up online and you can still buy it today. Oh, wow. Successful. It was innovative. So the cash orthopedic brace business was a huge success. It made the family very wealthy. And in 1982, David purchased a large home for his family to move into. So on November 7th, 1983, so a year later, Susan went to a baby shower at her friend's house and David took the three kids to Chuck E. Cheese around 6.30 p.m. There they had pizza and played, as you do at Chuck E. Cheese, leaving Mm -hmm. around 8 p.m. Wait, pause. Did you go to Chuck E. Cheese as a kid? No. Is it? That there was no Chuck E. Cheese in Thunder Bay. Is there one? No, not in Sault Ste. Marie, no. but there definitely, we would like visit Toronto a lot. Mm-hmm. And there was Chuck E. Cheese. I actually don't know if I've been in a Chuck E. Cheese. You just like play games and eat pizza. Mm. It was fun. We had a Ron's Virtual World, which was so much fun. Ron's Virtual World. <laughs> Laser tag? Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Okay. Okay, so. carry on. <laughs> just had to, just had to carry on in. with my murder. <laughs> <laughs> On their way home, they stopped at a bookmobile in the area where they returned some old books and they took out new ones. Have you been to a bookmobile? No. So I love the sound of it, though. It's like a tiny library on wheels. Exactly. I feel like the name cool. describes it perfectly. But that's exactly what it is. And I actually looked it up and there are some in Toronto. Wow. I wonder if they just go to more like remote areas or something, though. More remote yeah, pockets. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, like places not too per- super well connected by public transit. Yeah. So David put the children to bed before 9 p.m. Then Susan arrived home from the baby shower around 10.30. She and David talked before he left for Wausau, Wisconsin on a pre-planned business trip that night. Wausau is about a five-hour drive from Bloomington. Just make note of that. In the morning, David tried calling the family, but he wasn't able to get a hold of them. He tried a couple more times and asked his neighbors and some friends if they had seen them but they weren't able to reach them all day. He was getting a little bit nervous, so he called the police and he asked them to do a welfare check on the family. And he started that five hour drive back home. In the meantime, the police entered the home to find Susan, Rebecca, Grace, and Benjamin all dead. Oh my gosh. So an ax and knife were left in one of the rooms, which were deemed the murder weapons. And I'm not gonna get into the injuries here because they are a bit gruesome. But David arrived home to find multiple police cruisers outside, and he was told what happened. The house had also been trashed, so things were kind of like rifled through and like dumped out. But nothing really seemed to have been stolen, and there were no signs of forced entry. Hmm. The lead detective was suspicious of David right away, since he claimed he did not show much emotion upon hearing the news. But I feel like people show grief in different ways, so you can't really jump to any conclusions. But he was also skeptical about the business trip that David had left on because it was the middle of the night, which also seems super sketchy to me. It does seem super sketchy. Like, why would you think about going on a business trip at 1030 at night? You wouldn't. You'd wait till the next morning, even if it was 5 a.m. the next morning. Exactly. Um, But David claimed that he did leave for the trip between 1030 and 11 p.m., so right after Susan got home. And he did have a breakfast receipt from Wisconsin at 717 that next morning. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
But I mentioned that Wausau is only like five hours away. So Mm -hmm. there's still like a couple hours there that are seemingly unaccounted for. Maybe he checked into the hotel, had a one or two hour nap, and then was like, okay, that's enough. Breakfast time. Yeah, seems reasonable. Got to check in on the family. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Upon receiving the autopsy results, the medical examiner found that the veggies from the pizza that the kids had eaten at Chuck E. Cheese were still intact in their stomachs, specifically the tomato and oregano. This likely meant that the food was in the acidic environment of the stomach for less than two hours, which was not consistent with David's retelling of events. Hmm. While this information is enlightening and can be used alongside other evidence, it usually can't be used alone as gastric emptying times vary from person to person, as we were talking about. And also in certain situations, like if you've been physically active, which the children had been at Chuck E. Cheese. That's because physical activity can sometimes increase like the speed of gastric emptying. So digestion does stop at death. So the stomach contents essentially freeze in that state. So if the medical examiner was correct, the children were likely killed by 9 p.m., so two to three hours after they had eaten. And if that was the case, it would have been right before Susan had gotten home and before David had left on his trip. Oh, Okay. Yeah, that's super suspicious. Right. I do have one question, but I feel like it's going to be impossible to answer. But if you die and your digestion stops, that makes sense to me. But it's not like the contents of your stomach would neutralize. Mm -hmm. Like it would stay acidic. Yeah. No, I know. I actually asked myself the same question, but I couldn't find anything on this case specifically. I feel like if I looked that up more generally, I might be able to find something. Future editing Becca here. So when it comes to the analysis of contents in the digestive system, individuals performing an autopsy focus mainly on the location of the food. Like if a stomach is completely empty during analysis, the victim's last meal was likely at least four to six hours prior to death. However, in this case, because the food was still in the stomach, it seems like they also made an estimation using the breakdown of the food in the acidic environments to help establish that timeline. The police also thought this was super suspicious, as you did, Sarah, and they seem to have made up their minds about David and the fact that they thought he was guilty. Um, But they did struggle to find a motive. According to family and friends, David and Susan were a super happy couple. Shortly after the murder, unfortunately, police did find some compromising but not incriminating information. David would apparently hire models to wear his cash back brace for marketing photos. While he had never had an affair with any of the models, he had displayed some inappropriate behavior with the women. But other than that, they could not establish a motive, and there was no physical evidence that David had killed his wife or children. So luminol was then used around the home, and um, one of the bathrooms actually lit up. But this doesn't mean that blood was present. It can also mean that other compounds like bleach or soap have been found. And I actually just found this super interesting, but... Upon contact with blood, luminol reacts with the iron in hemoglobin, Mm. so the protein in our red blood cells. Oh, very cool. So make sure you're getting enough iron in your diet. Yes, iron and fiber, very important. But then the luminol can also react with metals and strong chemicals. So it is possible that the bathroom had just recently been cleaned, but unfortunately no testing, like additional testing, had happened on the bathroom. No blood was found in the drains. Uh, So it's likely that the murderer left in bloody clothing, but no blood was found in David's car either. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So despite the lack of evidence, David remained the key suspect. And about one month later, in December 1983, he was arrested and charged with the four murders. In October 1984, he pled not guilty to the crimes. To everyone's surprise, he actually received full support from Susan's family, who still believe he's innocent. I kind of think he's innocent too. Right? I do. It's challenging. Keep going. I'm sure you're going to tell me something. (laughs) During the trial, the DA emphasized David's participation in the conservative Plymouth Brethren denomination, which would ultimately prevent him from ever getting divorced. So their argument was that he had killed his family to get out of the marriage. And they brought up those cash models They brought them onto the stand, essentially, to testify about his behavior, Hmm. which I don't really think is fair, 
If somebody's being flirty, that doesn't make them a murderer. Yeah. I guess I, I need to see, like, the testimonies. Like, was right. he just, you know. I think he was just being Depends creepy. on the degree. Just being a creep. Yeah. <laughs> So the digestive forensic evidence of the pizza toppings were also presented at trial, which made jury members question David's timeline a lot. And on November 24th, 1984, he was convicted of all four murders. Wow. So this was despite some pretty important facts, like the fact that the blood splatter analysis and the presence of two murder weapons suggested two killers— and that there was some mislabeled evidence at the hands of the police. So rather than the death penalty, uh, Judge Richard Banner, he gave David four consecutive life sentences since he claimed to be unconvinced that David uh, had been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Because I feel like the same thought is going through our heads where it feels like there's a reasonable doubt. There's just like parts that don't add up to me. Like, why would he call in the welfare check? Why would he drive home right away? Like, he... I don't know. I, Why I feel like he would he bring his children to take out books right before. Yeah. Oh yeah, the bookmobile. Yeah, that's a great point. Right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I've thought a lot about this case. I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> but also like why would he have a relationship with his wife's family or continue to have a relationship? Yeah. And they're willing to have that relationship with him. Honestly, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> so you think he's innocent? I'll tell you at the end. Wait, okay. (laughs) Tell me at the end. Okay, so in 1990, so seven years later, his conviction was overturned and he received a retrial because of those model interviews. So the Illinois Supreme Court criticized the attempts to imply that David was having an affair when there was no real proof of that. In this second trial, they were not able to use the gastric evidence, unfortunately. Uh, so despite the fact that it was possible he was home at the time of these murders, the jury found him not guilty because they weren't given this information. Mm, okay. David has since relocated to Florida and continues to run his orthopedic and back brace company. He now lives with his fourth wife and children. So he remarried once in prison in 1988 and another wow. time in between. Okay, that's a little weird. The weirdest thing is that Susan's family actually attended the last wedding. Hmm. As I said, I feel like it's that maintained relationship that makes me wonder if he's actually innocent. Yeah. Or a sociopath. They probably know him really well, or a sociopath, (laughs) or a very convincing. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. As of March 2021, so this year, the Bloomington Police Department still has 127 pieces of physical evidence in storage. Um, so that if they were to ever reopen that case, they would be ready to go. Some of this evidence does include the stomach contents of the victims. Oh. Mm -hmm. I hope it's frozen. I wonder how they store it. Yeah, (laughs) frozen, (laughs) for sure. Pickled. (laughs) (laughs) Most recently, in 2008, Susan's sister, so the mom's sister, Martha Mm Neal's, She held a press conference to accuse her now ex-husband, John Neal's, of the murders. So it turns out that John had been incredibly jealous of David's success, and Martha now claimed she lied about his alibi that night, which was that he was at home with her. So she now claims that he went out to lift weights for a period of time that night. And um, another like separate fact was that Martha wasn't invited to that baby shower that Susan was at the night of the murders, and she had apparently cried about it. So another theory is that John went out to avenge his wife, which is a little crazy. It's a little overboard. (laughs) A little bit. Um, So regardless, Martha does claim that John, who did work at a hospital at this time, that he came home the night of the murder and gave her scrubs with blood on them, asking her to wash them. When asked where they came from, John said they belonged to a doctor that he worked with and named the doctor. But that doctor actually didn't work at that hospital at that time. And also would never say, hey, can you bring my scrubs home right? to wash them? <laughs> Is he the <laughs> scrub boy? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like we also have to remember this is mainly all hearsay mm-hmm. coming from Martha. For sure. And there's no conclusive evidence pointing to either Dave or John. So this case remains unopened and unsolved. Wow. The twists and turns. Twists and turns. And unfortunately, that is the case of the Hendricks family murder. 
So there's no happy ending or resolution, but it does go to show the significance of digestive forensics and that significant, like what significance it can have in casting doubt on statements and time of death. So, mm. I mean, identifying a timeline, it can really help determine like who the victim was with or how they may have died if even like drugs or pathogens were involved. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, in criminal cases, it can't really be used alone, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's a super cool science. It is a super cool science. I love it. I love the intersection of true crime and food. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we're here to so do. So get your fiber, get your iron, keep your liver healthy. <laughs> and don't die. And try not to get murdered. <laughs> when we cover these cases that are like true, true crime, they're pretty intense. I know. I like how we disperse them but with like a historical story and more, you know, food industry story. I don't know. True, true crime gets dark. It does get dark. And that's why I didn't talk about like the, the cause of death and yeah, the injuries yeah. and stuff. It, it kind of puts me in a bad mood when I like get too deep into it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I hope you did enjoy that. I know there was no real resolution to it, but it's just so fascinating how evidence like stomach contents. Yeah can really persuade a jury. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is so cool. Okay, so we've decided, Beck and I are just finishing up our master's programs. We're in the final stretch. We're only going to do the main episodes of Unsavory. Mm. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to forget so Until many times. I know. And are we still calling it extra cheese? Yes. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> Phew. Executive decision made. On air. Perfect. <laughs> so we're just going to do these main episodes until we finish the program and then we'll bring back extra cheese because we love doing extra cheese and sharing your stories and keeping up with the news. But it's just a little too much for our plates right now. <laughs> Truly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that will start in January mm -hmm. 2022 because we're done the program in December. So continue to send us your audio clips. We've received a few yeah. so far for season two and um, we're so excited to share them. I love listening to them. Yeah, they're the it's best. The best. <laughs> okay, Becca, I haven't briefed you on this. No, so you first thing that comes to mind. Oh, no. What is the worst nutrition trend you've seen on social media lately? Um, nutrition or food trend? Either. Could be either. Uh, the mustard on watermelon was pretty gross. Oh, my gosh. That was awful. I saw that, too. <laughs> I the tried sugar it. on the cucumber. Tried that, too. It? And? Both not good. Okay, sugar and cucumber, I could like maybe, like I don't support it. I don't think it's a great idea, but I could see it not tasting awful. Mustard on watermelon? I actually think no. I preferred the watermelon over the cucumber. Did the flavors like weirdly complement each other in a good way? Like not really. It still tasted like you're eating watermelon with mustard on it, but it wasn't, mm. it wasn't the worst thing in the world. Okay, I guess it's not the worst nutrition trend. It was just the first one that popped into my head. Yeah, yeah. But it's just like a silly food trend that you're like, why? Just eat watermelon. Yeah. I feel like after we hop off this uh, this recording, though, I'm going to think of a thousand more. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's one? Sure. What's yours? I know you've thought of well, one. Well, the actual real answer is what our next episode is on, <laughs> but I'm not going to spoil it. Top secret. Don't do it. That's the actual worst trend, and it's not even really a trend. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> but maybe the chlorophyll thing that's happening. Mm, chlorophyll. chlorophyll water. Yeah. I haven't done a lot of research into it, but I'm just like, we don't need to put that in our water. Yeah. Oh, how yeah. about that um, fruititarian? Oh, fruitarian. And that yeah. uh, came forward a couple of years ago. Was that like two yeah, years ago? I don't love that. Pre-COVID. I love fruit, but I need more in my life than fruit. Ditto. A lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Many other things. <laughs> All right. Well, that was fantastic. You did a wonderful job. So did you. Welcome Thank to you. season two. Welcome to season two. It feels so good to be back. Yeah, it does. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unsavory. You can find all the references and materials used to put this episode together in our show notes at unsavorypodcast.com. This is an independently produced podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would rate, review, follow, and share our show with your true crime and food-loving friends. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can sign up as a donor through our Patreon link in our bio. To keep up to date with the podcast, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Unsavory Podcast. If you have an idea for an episode or segment, email us at unsavorypod at gmail.com. 
This podcast was recorded and edited by Earworm Radio. We highly recommend their services for all of your podcasting needs. You can learn more about them at earwormradio.com.